Hello, Internet, and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff. Tonight, we've got a excellent guest for you guys that isn't Chris, some fun Ooh. news topics, and some t- community drama that we're going to try to straighten out tonight for our main topic. So with that, Aaron, what are you drinking? I have Yingling still. I have, I'm pretty much saving it for the podcast because I don't get out much anymore. <laughs> and uh, our special guest today is Joe. Joe, what are you drinking? Uh, tonight I'm drinking Revolt Pecan Whiskey with uh, uh, Buffalo Trace um, Whiskey mixed in. And that's how you Ooh. know it's not me saying Joe or <laughs> that Joe because whiskey. No. And uh, tonight I am still drinking some Gumball Head from Three Floyds. So I had the most amazing Three Floyds beer this weekend, by the way. Oh, yes. It was called Apocalypse Cow. Yeah. <laughs> and it is a double IPA. Excellent. And it was... It was amazing. I always hear you guys talking. Hands down. I always hear you guys talking about uh, Three Floyds, and Three Floyds is down the road for me. So it's like, that's just another place to go to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To, to you, it's like our industry. When I was worked on the ambulance, I would always work their festivals. So it was like, it just became a nuisance to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually have a... Um, a bomber of Dark Lord from this year's Dark Lord days that I was going to crack open on the fire last night, but I couldn't convince Chris and Aaron to come over because, you know, they have lives, apparently. Wow. I didn't, I didn't realize that was a physical invitation. Oh, yeah. That was a physical invitation. Well, shit. Yep. Well, now you know. <laughs> I still have the still have the bomber because I'm not drinking that myself. No. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, before we get started into news, who are you, Joe? Why are you here? I'm the founder of Project R3D or Project R- Red, is what I prefer it being called. Um, we make the Railcore uh, kits and fully assembled printers, and before that, we had the D series printers. So that's mainly what we do. Nice, nice. Joe and 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 this Joe and Aaron. We all had the pleasure of hanging out with each other for like a whole weekend during Maker Fest, and uh, found out we got along real well. And you know, that's pretty cool. Joe and I have known each other for a couple of years now, uh, from when you started the D series printer. One of the other Maker Spaces hooked us up. Yeah, and we just haven't really connected on the level that we did that weekend. Yeah, we've ran into each other at, at Murph, and that was about it. But, yeah, we yeah. met through a mutual friend. I just remember when I was first starting my company, and our, our mutual friend Jay's like, you should talk to this guy. And I just emailed you one night, and you're like, just don't go to the race at the bottom with the rest of China. Just don't do that. And I've never done it. <laughs> That's the best advice I can give to anybody. Is keep your standards up. I took it to uh, heart. I'm glad you haven't. Especially glad you haven't taken the, the rail core to the bottom. Yeah, well, there's been threats for, from people that want to do that. And it's an open source project. They're welcome to. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been kind of weird. But the whole pro- the, the advantage to the rail core is it's not a cheap printer to build. So especially... Uh, the larger well-known con- uh, companies from overseas, specifically the in the Asia area, they uh, they won't get the turnover they expect and profits, so they stay away from it. Similar to what they do with the Lulzbot. The reason they don't touch the Lulzbot is because of the price to, to manufacture. And the rail core is not an easy thing to mass produce, uh, especially assembled. Uh, no. It's a very extensive build. We will dive into that in about 10 minutes. So starting us out, uh, first news topic tonight, uh, Aaron, Bart Dring, and the Gerbil ESP32. Since since you love that stuff, why don't you go ahead and talk about it? 
Yeah, so Bart Deering has been working on his uh, Gribble ESP32 port um, for the ESP32 chip. And it now supports six axis G code. And he made a really fun looking machine and a uh, accompanying YouTube video, which kind of shows how it shows it working. And it's just really neat and exciting because the ESP actually hosts its own little uh, web server. So you can actually control the machine from your phone. And if there's anything I love more, it's controlling my really nice CNC machine from my phone. You know, I'm not going to lie. I love this thing. Um, the The whole six-axis G-code thing. and I especially love the little pin plotter that Bart built to demo it. It's so neat. It's got it's two three-axis pin plotters like horizontally opposed from each other, but imposing on each other's build area. And he's got them drawing in each other. It's, I don't know, it's fun. It's exactly the kind of maker CNC machine I like to see, which is hilariously complex for no reason. Uh, and in other news about hilariously complex projects that took a while, Smoothieware has announced the Kickstarter for the Smoothie Board V2 is starting like in the next Noon. day. Uh, uh, it might, it'll probably be active once this gets released. Yes. This episode. Yeah, and in fact, he's actually asking for a special email list for people to pre, like, get the the email for the uh, it, as soon as it the project goes live, and he'll have a reduced price for the first early birds. So, um, if you get one of those, let us know. Um, I thought about signing up for it. I decided against it. I'm going to be busy with other controller projects for a little bit, so. But good luck, Arthur, if you want to come on the show and talk about it. We'd love to have you on. Uh, in other product launches that are exciting and we've had our hand in, uh, Cohesion 3D announced the uh, the launch of their rotary axis yesterday, a couple days ago. A rotary for what? Rotary axis for a laser. Cohesion, there we go. Yeah, Cohesion 3D is a laser controller company, but they are now a laser hardware company. I'm personally excited about this. I had a major hand in designing and sourcing and manufacturing this rotary axis. Um, we are specifically excited about the fact that this is probably one of the better engineered ones on the market. I'm not out here to toot my own horn, but you know, we spent a little bit yeah, okay. of time. No, we spent a little bit of time to make sure things like proper axial constraint of the rotary wheels was taken into account. Um, all of the rotary drive components are concentric, you know, little things that I think some of the other rotaries have ignored. Um, everything is access adjustable without tools. Um, super highly configurable it's i don't know it's a neat rotary axis i'm excited about it i've already engraved dick butts with it <laughs> onto dank meme cans no less um, oh yeah <laughs> it's the first thing i did um so it's pretty great it fits in the k40 um yeah i have a lot of good things to say about it if you guys want to give me feedback on how great or awful my engineering is. I'm happy to hear it. Specifically the awful. Tear it apart. I don't care. Uh, I can only get better from your feedback. When I was talking to him at, at uh, Maker Fest, it's, he's gone to such fine details on it. He's like got the uh, etching marks on the extrusion oh, right. and he's gone, he's gone above and beyond what I would have expected. Uh, yeah. For for something that's gonna uh, work hand in hand with the K40 and stuff like that, he's he's really uh, set the standard, especially with his boards. And now he's just he's moving into hard more hardware. And it's gonna uh, bring the K40 way up. Yeah, the end goal is to make the K40 worth it. Worth it. I mean, it already is worth it. It's three hundred dollar laser, and when you can make it on par with an epilogue. With yeah, a few upgrades. It's 
Yeah, and those upgrades tend to be the things like from Cohesion, the yeah. board. And so he yeah, he's making it a safer machine, and, and he's making it, you know, a space, especially in a small shop, <clears throat> in someone's garage, um, it makes it worth having. Yeah. Well, and, you know, we have guys in our makerspace that have access to an $80,000 universal laser that I put in the Caterpillar maker space and they refuse to use it after using the K40 that we have there and the laser that I built there and Lightburn just because Lightburn is like a no holds barred upgrade compared to the software that the epilogues and the universals and the Trotex run. Um, it's just ridiculous. And then, a couple hundred dollars and with a controller and you have a amazing laser. So. It, it looks like with this uh, rotary, he's got all of the uh, like additional parts already ready to go as well. Um, he's got the, yeah. he's got it available. He's already got the tensioning arm and replacement silicone rings. And he's even got an, a driver set up and the wiring connectors. He's ready to go. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we worked really hard to make sure this thing would just work by plugging in right out of the box. It's pretty pretty great. It's nice. And in other product releases that I'm less excited about, Aaron? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you may have seen it on our Twitter. It is, it could put quite potentially be a thing, but the Makers on Tap fanny pack. <laughs> Wait, it's uh, it, after last week's. <laughs> go ahead. It's posted on Twitter. Yes. Is it? Is the purchasing yeah. link already posted too? Oh no. Oh, that's what I need. No, it it was de- it was definitely more of a here's here's a picture of a Maker's on Tap fanny pack thinking emoji. <laughs> it, so after last week's episode, uh, Joe and I were talking about maybe coming up with some sort of merch, Maker's on Tap merch we could sell. Or something. I don't know. Just, you know, we've been doing this year. It'd be nice if, you know, if we made something out of it, yeah. you know, maybe just cover the hosting costs or subsidized, you know, subsidized costs for travel to maker events, stuff like that. So little things. Yeah. Not trying to make a living off of it, but take the living away from it a little bit. <laughs> but, you know, right. when I mentioned that, I didn't mention... I didn't mean like fanny packs. I meant like we make like limited run objects. Flamethrowers? Like we would make them. Flamethrowers. That could be a great option. Makers on tap flamethrower. Impress your friends. Cook your barbecue. <laughs> SpaceX route. I did. I did want to start doing the space balls thing where it's like makers on tap the flamethrower. <laughs> makers on tap the fanny pack. <laughs> And then Aaron throws that out, and I'm like, this is exactly what I didn't mean, but I, whatever. <laughs> I'm sure somebody will love this. I'm okay with your thing, too. We should we should do better. This just requires zero effort on our end. Yes. Yes. But, you know, the people that listen to us, they make things. I'm sure they, I go out of my way to buy things from people that I enjoy that they make things. Like, I bought a $150 hobby knife, because the dude makes awesome hobby knives. You know, that was a I love that knife. I don't regret that purchase at all. Um, you know, support the people that you enjoy kind of thing. By buying our fanny packs. Yep. Or that. Yeah. I'm probably going to get one. Let's be real. When you have, when you need to bring your, you know, wire crimpers or your uh, pliers, additional hot ends, where are you going to put them? Your pocket? Like a pleb? No. And the fanny You've, pack. Yeah. Have you stabbed yourself in the butt with wire crimpers yes. before? Because I have. Yes. That's or, terrible. Or had them close on your skin when they're in your pocket? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, not with man. the fanny pack. Not with the Makers <laughs> on Tap fanny pack. <laughs> All right. Joe sold me. I'm getting one. <laughs> All right. I'm going to have to get an actual link then for this. All right. I've got all the back end uh, stuff all connected now, so we've got our own store somewhere. There's no public link for it, but it's, it's there and it, and it, and it kind of works. I've got it integrated with this other dropshipping company where we can come up with our own designs and 
stuff like that. But yeah, we'll see where it goes. You think they make makers on, or you think they make like tool rolls and bandoliers? Yeah. You ever seen that movie Passenger with um, Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence? Yeah. That scene where he pulls his tools out of the case and he's it. got that that wicked tool bandolier. I want that for my printer tools for Murph. Yeah. I just want to show up with just like whoa and like all this wonderfulness. Just like have an and, extra hot end in there and everything. Yeah. Oh. Extra Sigma drivers, because yeah. apparently I need those. <laughs> get a get a belt with just nozzles, like magnum nozzles. Like mm. where there would be bullets, <laughs> little magnum nozzles. <laughs> E3D, if you're listening to this, I will make the belt if you will sponsor filling it with hot end components. The belt will be made. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you're listening, Greg. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. We need the weekly Greg check in. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that would be so much fun. I always tend to uh, cause problems with stupid ideas, so... <laughs> no, those are great ideas. Great ideas. Oh, well, I've been making 3D printed axe covers and axe holsters, so that just, like, brings it up a notch. Yeah. Yeah, I feel bad every time at, like, Murph and stuff, I'll walk up to someone's table and be like, this is an awesome project. Oh, have you ever tried this? And I walk away and they're just like, now I gotta work so much harder to try that because that random guy just gave me a stupid idea. <laughs> Dude, I was talking to you about the laser bed, uh, K40 table <laughs> at, at Maker Fest, and you're like, "Dude, what if you stood out of like folded sheet steel?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh fuck." <laughs> well, we had talked now about I got new version that. too. <laughs> but you know, folded sheet steel in America is expensive, and we don't Not live in South Africa or China. We don't have a break. We have what? a. Well, I want a, I want a decent pan break. Yeah. And honestly, like Harbor Freight sells a one that would probably make the bed for like 200 bucks. So yeah, maybe we should just buy that for the space. That's one of those things. Even finding a really good used one is really hard to do because yes. they last, they literally last forever. They do one job, but they do it very well. And so, yeah. like, unless you run it over with, like, a semi and then pour lava on it, they're not going to break. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a steel worker. Like, there's nothing in them to break. Like, yeah. They just, they're just going to work forever. Yeah. <sighs> I'm already halfway through my beer. All right. So. Mine's gone. <sighs> Do we need to take a beer break? Well, we didn't. I'd be okay with that. We didn't start recording until. 30 minutes after we started the video. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's 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 par for the course, man. Okay. <laughs> there's there's got to be 30, 30 minutes of jitter-jabber to get it all out of our system. Oh, yeah. So the, the, the episodes sound like we're still full of mischief and stuff, but there was 30 minutes of getting it out of our system first. <laughs> yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could. Yeah, so many times we're like, we just need to get recording, and then we keep talking. And it's like we just need to hit record. I believe Joe said <laughs> this is a perfect, you know, podcast topic, and then we just talk every fucking time. <laughs> we just kept talking. Yeah, I don't even remember what it was about. Like, oh, uh, we were complaining about Wi-Fi controllers. Yeah. So, all right, so let's get on our topic, and that will probably bring us back into the fun conversation. So. Um, why did you guys, Joe, why did you guys take over doing the rail core kits and stuff? Why did, why did you guys pick that up? So I met Tony at Murph, not this last year, but the year before, of course. And, uh, I love the printer. And then I heard from somebody that somebody was going to be picking them up and making kits for them. And then, so I was kind of saddened by that. Because I loved it, but I was very I was happy at the same time because I wanted it to exist. Um, right, it was the only thing, and especially when you you hear engineers saying, "Oh, it's over engineered," then you know it makes me love it more because they're engineers. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So after about two months of just idly standing in the back, like stalking <laughs> the project, uh, 
I reached out to Tony and I was like, hey, so what's going on with uh, they're becoming kids? And he's like, oh, I don't think that's really happening. Are you interested? It's like, absolutely. We set up a time to meet. And the nice thing was, is looking at his bill of materials, I had almost everything on hand. So it was going to be a very quick transition and very easy transition. I already had the, the suppliers. I had the connections. I knew that all I had to do was make a couple calls and I'd have stuff ready to go. So uh, September 20, I believe it was 29th, uh, last year, him and I met up at a Starbucks. And I walked in, and it was easy to spot Tony because he had a rail core in the middle of the Starbucks. Just <laughs> sitting on the table. <laughs> and, yeah, it was like, you you know a true, uh, true 3D printing nerd if you walk in, there's a rail core sitting in the middle yeah. of Starbucks. So we sit down, we just start talking. And come to find out, we were pretty much, uh, we had the same same drive towards the community. We wanted to help build a community while also pushing it forward, not sitting on our laurels. Um, so him and I agreed that we would want to do it, and uh, Steve was all right with it, who's the other uh, partner in Railcore Labs. And a couple days later, we announced that we were doing it, and... It took us about eight days to ship the first kit because we had pretty much everything on hand. It was a very quick oh, wow. turnaround. Yeah. Yeah. Made it very quick. And uh, that first kit went out and it got that. That was the first kit that got reviewed uh, by 3D Printing Nerd. And we had already started shipping kits to everybody else. And it's kind of been once his review hit, things kind of blew up. <laughs> and. And we just kept building kits and fully assembled printers and shipping lots and lots of them. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Nice. But how many do you think you guys have, have shipped now? We've shipped about 300 of them. That's a lot of printers. Yeah, and to a lot of like, people it is. To a lot of people it isn't. <laughs> well, yeah. like, But, I mean... You guys are, it's just you and your wife, right? Uh, me, my girlfriend, uh, my girlfriend. sister's boyfriend, and my mom helps do a lot of the packing just because she's got okay. experience with that. But yeah, it's a very small team. That's a lot of printers for three people. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a couple. Um, I, yeah, I, uh, we work hard and long hours. Yeah. <laughs> And especially because a lot of the components are made by you guys, right? You yeah, guys well, make we, the side panels. We make the side panels. We do all the 3D printed parts. Uh, a lot of the wiring harnesses are done by us. Um, we've tried to outsource the wiring harnesses to three different companies in the U.S. And all three times it came back terrible. Um, so we've kept them in, in-house as much as possible. <laughs> okay. So... At the end of the day, having it in the house, it lets us uh, only blame ourselves. <laughs> yeah. And I true. like being able to do that. <laughs> so are rail cores printing rail cores? No. Is there a rail core God no. over there? God no. <laughs> I, I can't keep a rail core for myself for the life of me. Every time I build one, I go, this is mine. And someone goes, can I buy that? And I go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, no rail cores in the print farm. There is rail cores just for testing uh, new setups new profiles uh like we have one now with a dual hot end um we've got one now uh we got one with dual hot end and then we got another one in the works that's going to be a deeper one for dual hot end and then hopefully another one soon and then i gotta get making the mini which we've got in the works and then we also have high temp printers in the works and yeah we got a lot of things going on <laughs> But for the most part, we use D-series printers, which is our old models for okay. printing a lot of the stuff. And then, uh, just like, we have a couple Prusas, some Maker Gears that we pretty much just got for testing. Um, a Ray's 3D Pro that literally sits there and does nothing, because it's pretty much what it's good at. Um, <laughs> that's about... Yeah, 
That's about I it. thought those were good printers until I talked to like a few people the week you came and hung out. It, like everybody that I mentioned it to, they're like, "Yeah, don't do that." Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it's good for certain circumstances. Did you know that's a Chinese printer? I think I told you that. It may have been you. Yeah, I don't w- know. When I call them and they're like, yeah, we don't do Q- any QC in the U.S. It's like, oh, that's great. And and then like all the dots started connecting because when yeah. you get the box, it's already on a pallet. It's palleted, even the small one, um, which I, is not really a small printer, but it comes on a pallet. You open it up and all of the power plugs for all over the world are included. It's like, Why? Why are you ah. that? and <laughs> you're, you're because exactly they don't right. open it back up? Yeah, they they ship it, store it in a warehouse, and I got it directly from their warehouse. And yeah, it, was, it took about a week for their support to get it to work. So. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's interesting. They go to great lengths to hide the fact that it's a Chinese printer. Yeah, like they've even transplanted their CEO into LA. Yeah, so. Yeah, they're they say they're based out of California and stuff. And don't get me wrong, the display looks really good. It's just useless. It's a Chinese Android tablet. Yeah, what so, do you think like, that's doing on your network right now? <laughs> well, all of the printers are on their own network. They're not connected to the actual internet. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that that's good. <laughs> yeah. My biggest problem with it is if you push the button, it'll light up, and you'd be like, "Oh, I pushed the button." And you'll come back like three hours later and you're like, oh, this print should be done. And you walk back and it's like, do you want to start this print? It's like, oh, oh. <laughs> and then you just like shove your finger through the screen because you're just frustrated. And it's like, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, I'll do that. It's like, mm, I don't know. All right. So <laughs> ranting about Chinese printers aside, <laughs> it's my favorite thing. Um, you guys recently made a big change to how you are distributing your printers yes why so <laughs> what did uh, you do we i hear it's bullshit yeah i heard i heard that too um mainly because the distributor we went with is what most people are complaining about <laughs> which makes no sense um so we ended up going with a reseller for our units and that's pretty much how we're going to be moving forward with everything mainly because the fulfillment side, it's easier to for us to just put everything and make 30 of them, throw them in a box, and ship them to a reseller. And then they, they do all of the customer fulfillment side. We do one fulfillment, and they do 30, um, which frees us up to let us do more development on new projects, uh, ramp up production. With this, we are able to do a lot more printers before we were we were hitting 15 printers a week shipping um in the last week we did about 48 um so wow we were that's so it's it we're not the big advantage is the fact that it's like okay we're gonna set two days aside and today these two days we're only gonna milk Mm-hmm. We're not we're not going to set aside some time for someone to be packing, and we're not going to sit. So it's just everybody is full bore on milling, or everybody's full bore on wiring harnesses, and like granted, the milling side we you do a lot of things in between cuts and stuff like that. So we're able to maximize our time as much as possible, and on top of that, um, I if you were to start making a printer these days in the US and you wanted to get a duet uh, they will most likely send you to a reseller because the duet guys are kind of overwhelmed because everybody wants their boards and who's the person they're going to send you to it's most likely going to be Tim he's one of their biggest resellers in the US and he has so Tim uh, for Elmore from Philistrator so he he we have all we since day one Tim has been a part of the Railcore project when uh when Tony and and Steve were working on the real, developing the Railcore Tim's who they went to and Tim helped them out a lot so they've built a good relationship with him and so have I so pretty much all of my V6s and all of my Bontex and duets and 2Xs 
a lot of that stuff came from Phyllis Shooter just because they were and are one of the biggest resellers of all those products in the U.S. So, um, having that establishment already done, it, it wouldn't really make sense for us to then buy everything from them, ship to us. We have to pay shipping and a markup because Tim needs to make his money to run his business. Now what we're doing is we're shipping him all the stuff and he's adding in whatever you choose. What's nice is now he's letting you choose a lot of different things. You can choose from, instead of, we were just doing the Duet Wi-Fi and the Duet X5. Now you have the Duet Wi-Fi, the Duet Wi-Fi with the antenna and the, du uh, the Duet Ethernet are now all options. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, hot end, you still get, He's now got the mosquitoes, and uh, he's got V6s. Um, we're working on a new magbed option um, to be selling through the store. Uh, so the biggest advantage is he's going to be offering a lot more options. Uh, the uh, Masumi rails are going to pretty much be the biggest. That's what we try to push people towards just because they are amazing. Um, he still is offering the Zeltec rails, but the biggest advantage in all of this is the fact that you are getting more options and w through his store, he has free shipping on anything over a hundred dollars. So, uh, there is a, there has been a price markup, which has been coming for a while, mainly because when we started this project, there was two major things that have changed. Uh, when Tony and I sat down. <laughs> we were sitting there joking around in Starbucks saying, we're only going to sell 40 of these. That's all we're going to sell. Nobody really wants these. It's just a couple people who are like, I'm going to go all out. Well, wait, there's these people over here who already have. So we're going to sell 40 of these and they're going to be done. And at the time it was great for me because I already had all the sourcing. I didn't have to ramp up a whole new line. I didn't have to source all these new things because I, was on, I already had it. And we were yeah. only going to do 40. So it was just going to be a nice thing. We were going to end probably in January, February and be done. That didn't happen. Uh, we did 30 last year and then, uh, well, up to December 23rd. And then the review hit and we did like, I think, 40 before the end of the year. <laughs> On top of the 30 we had already had. And currently we're set, shipped out over. 300 so yeah it didn't work Thanks, out the things way. yeah so when we in the beginning we were, we were since we were only expecting 40 we were like well we're not going to make much profit because it's only going to be 40 and we're only catering to these certain people we just really want to help them get get the printers we i just wanted more rail cores to be out there because i knew the people who were going to get them were going to do amazing things like jason pruis yeah <sighs> that guy's crazy um, and I knew people like that were going to get them. And in the first batch, that's the majority of the people who got them. Um, were just people who I knew were going to do amazing things and blow me away. And then, uh, once things started picking up, it, we realized, well, growing doesn't always going from uh, one to 50 can be easy. Going one to a hundred can be much harder. And, Prices don't always go down when you're hitting that much volume. You always think, oh, well, uh, the more you buy, the cheaper it is. Yes. Parts got cheaper. Getting everything done got more expensive. Yep. And then we these fun things called tariffs came into effect. Oh, those are fun. Thanks, um, Trump. We're not paying those, right? No, no, no. Yeah, China's um, paying those. Yeah, China's China, paying all China those. pays those. But China sends me the bill, I guess. So uh, yeah. I'm paying them. <laughs> so when it comes down to power supplies, uh, power supplies for us were like 20 bucks. I'm paying almost 35 now with tariff. Like after everything, shipping and everything like that, things have gone up dramatically. Um, aluminum extrusions got more expensive. Uh, pretty much every electronic component is more expensive now. Um, but we didn't reflect that in the cost of the printer. So gradually, as tariffs got higher and production got higher, our profits went down. Um, just because of costs. We had to buy more mills and we had to buy more printers and we had to do this and we had to do that. So 
Uh, things got more expensive, but we were able to sustain. We have zero debt in the business. Uh, we've done everything from uh, everything possible, pretty much right out of the bank account. Trying to, we wanted to keep self-sustaining as possible. And then, so w- when with the transition, it brought on. Well, now not only do we have to make our bills and make our money, uh, we all Tim also has to pay his employees to pack the printers. He's got to still have. He still has to pay all the shipping material just because you pay shipping. That goes to the shipper. That doesn't count for the box that costs two fifty a piece. That doesn't count for the bubble wrap, which is ridiculously expensive. Why am I paying for bubbled air? It's yep. free. Um, <laughs> it's they have to package that air. Damn it. Well, yeah, and then the machine. You could buy the machine to package your own air, but the machine is like three thousand dollars. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, do you know how much cardboard costs? <laughs> It's cardboard. <laughs> Cardboard's insane. The Bottom's amount of card insane. It, it's sad the amount of cardboard I throw away, and I just like see it get taken off to the dump or the recycling center. And you're like, tomorrow I'm gonna go on U line and I'm gonna spend five hundred dollars and replace them with more boxes. <laughs> 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 so it, uh, you have to account into all of those things, and then uh, now we have a uh, reseller we have to deal with and shipping from me to him and all that other stuff and the night the biggest change is with this is he's holding stock now up to now we've always had a lead time because it was hard we weren't expecting this we weren't expecting this volume um and we didn't want to go crazy and buy a large amount of volume and go into debt and end up sitting on this volume because we've seen so many 3d printing companies fail right and at the end of the day, you see them selling off their stock. It's like, yeah, we bought that stock. Their stock most likely is the reason they failed. Their stock and their overhead, because right now, I mean, like if everything shut down, we could sustain because we have very low overhead. We don't have a but we don't have five hundred printers sitting in the shop. Uh, Phil Schroeder. We'll be holding some on hand. Uh, so when you order, it's, you're getting it in the next couple days, most likely. Um, good, like, we just shipped him 30 units. So that that's one big advantage. That uh, free shipping over 100 bucks, And we've upgraded a few things. Like, he's been able to get a really good source on gates, belts, and idlers. So... Moving forward, all kids through Phil Shooter have gates, belts, and idlers. And it makes such a huge difference. It really does. When I didn't think it would. I didn't I believe did. all the hype. And then I, I printed with it, and I was like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, I didn't appreciate it until I got the tool changer. But I was like, oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, not like I ha- I've had people who are like, oh, well, I bought the, the idlers, but I'm not going to pay that much for the belt. It's like you just threw your money away. Or I bought the belt, but I have Chinese idlers because sixty bucks for idlers is ridiculous. Yeah, it's like no, <laughs> no. Yeah. So the uh, the great things is like before this, it was a hundred. I believe it was one hundred fifteen dollars for the Gates belts and idler kits. Um, shipping, everybody was paying between sixty and one hundred twenty bucks for shipping, um, depending on the kit and where they were. Uh, Outside of the U.S., we had some people paying five hundred dollars for shipping. Um, wow! I had one person pay twelve hundred dollars for shipping. Holy crap! But Where that did was that on go to? four units going to Prague. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so I mean, like, it, shipping's expensive. So you're getting you're you're getting that that's covering the the boxes and everything else he's got to provide, and then he's throwing in the gates idlers and. Uh, and pulleys and belt, and then on top of that, he he messaged me one day and he goes, "I don't I don't think people should have to tap their extrusion." It's like, all right. He's like, "We're we're gonna we're we have to do tapped extrusion moving forward," because in the beginning we didn't tap the extrusion because the people who were buying were like the super nerds, yeah, and that's who we we really catered to at first. It's like they have a tap. If they don't have a tap, they're going to need a tap next week. So buy it anyways. 
<laughs> yep. You know what I mean? Um, so yep. now they all come with tapped extrusion. And everybody goes, oh, well, that's that's not worth anything. Well, go to Masumi and ask them to tap M3 taps into a 1515 extrusion. They won't. They'll do it in 2020, and it's an M5. And it's $6 for two taps. So $3 a tap. And there's a lot of taps. There's four, eight, eight, sixteen, seventeen. Twenty-four taps in every rail core. I didn't know fifteen fifteen was M three. Oh yeah. It's one I don't blame them for doing that. <laughs> yeah, well it's very it, it, you break a lot of taps, it's very difficult. Um yeah. by hand, it's easy. I've I've never broken a tap by hand in an M3, but <laughs> uh, five printers will take me an hour and a half to two hours to tap. Yeah, um, by hand we don't do that. <laughs> but the uh, tapping this batch of extrusion, this thir- these thirty printers, uh, took nine to twelve hours is what it was estimated to tap all those taps. Yeah, and Masumi charges three dollars per tap. $3 times 24, you're looking at about 70 bucks. So, yes, there was a price jump. $70 for tapping, $115 for gates, idlers, and belts, and pulleys, and free shipping. That eats up all of that. that really uh, does. Jump in price. And the fact that there's no lead time. He's shipping, I believe, tomorrow, his first units. And he just opened up orders on Friday night, so there there's no lead time, and, and all <laughs> all these upgrades uh, really take into effect. And a lot of the people have liked where this is going. And there's been some confusion. Some people think that we're out of the loop. We're no longer doing it. No, we are still doing all of the manufacturing side. Pretty much what we're doing is we're doing everything that isn't supplied by E3D Duet or Bond Tech. Or gates. Everything else, those things come in boxes. Fill the shooters, then putting those boxes into uh, uh, the main box. And then adding in all the stuff we make. It's a resale. A lot of people are, seem to be confused that that uh, that means they're taking over the whole project. But when you resell a Lulzbot or you resell an Ulti Maker, um, that doesn't mean, you know, that you're making uh, matter, matter hackers has taken over, no, or printed solid or filler shooter doesn't mean they're taking over. It is still our project. The Railcore Labs team, uh, is still hand in hand with this. We are still right on. And, uh, what's been really cool, and I just found out about this a couple days ago when I was on the phone with Tim from filler shooter, is that not only are we giving 10% of our profits of the kit to the Railcore Labs team to continue development, but he's also donating part of the revenue from the kits to Railcore Labs. To, oh, wow. Yeah, to, to include the, with theirs and ours, they pretty much doubled the amount of money we donate to Railcore Labs. So the, the development of like the mini that's in the works and things like that, it, it's going to be so much easier for the real core labs team because it's an open source project. They didn't want money from us in the beginning. And I told them I refused to do that. I refused to take their project and not pay them for the work they've been doing. And right. if you go on the Facebook group or the discord and you post a question, um, Tim or, or uh, Tony or Steve will most likely be there to answer that question. And, or, you'll also get about a thousand people who jump on and answer the question as well, because the community behind the real core project is amazing. Don't get me wrong. There's always going to be a couple people where you're like, I, I wish you were nicer, <laughs> but for the most part, like we've all kind of tried to keep the real core community to the people we knew were going to be kind to each other and good for the project. Because we we don't need any more negative Nancys. That's not. I'm in the Railcore Discord. Oh, I don't even have a Railcore. We really need to kick you out of there. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But so, like, the Railcore community has been 100 percent like the best thing about the Railcore. The support, 
the just the kindness. I was compared to uh, when somebody found out about the Phil Shooter uh, thing, us teaming up with Phil Shooter. Uh, I was compared to uh, landscaping material, and I had never been more honored to be compared to landscaping material. He said I was a a boulder among rocks, <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, <laughs> hit me right in the feels." <laughs> But it's like, what does that even mean? <laughs> but it, it it got me. <laughs> but uh, so it's just like the community has been amazing. That's one hundred percent of what it's been about. And then like the fact that when Tony and Steve and I talk, um, it's not oh well, I'm manufacturing. You guys came up with the idea. It's like you know would be awesome to do. Let's do this. Or Tony would be like. I think we should do this. I go, okay, do it. Let me know how much money you need. Well, let's get it done. Or, oh, we sh- I think this would be a cool upgrade. It's like, well, how quickly can we get it done? Because a lot of people are like, oh, well, this is selling well now. Let's just stop yes. while we're ahead. It's like, yes, no. Let's push the boundaries. And that's what's great about the rail core itself. It's like, I, I think 3D printing, especially with large manufacturing, um, it's slowed down. They they release something new, but it's it, they took a baby step. Yep. It's like let's let's everything's take leaps. been incremental. Nobody has made a big breakthrough in a long time. Yeah, let's take leaps. It's like um, when when uh, Wade from Mandela Roseworks, who is like quintessential to the Railcore project right now. He's making upgrade parts. He makes a stepper and idler mounts now for us. Um, he makes the X carriages. He's been great. Seven one three's done a lot for the group as well. Uh, he used to make our separate Eiler mounts. He's made the halos and stuff like that. A lot of cosmetic things. Um, a lot of functional things. Uh, it's been pretty much just a combination of people working together. It was what's been crazy about it. But on top of that, it's like... Uh, when to- when Wade and I were talking about a dual dual printer or dual hot end for the rail core, I said, oh, well, it's got to be a teeter-totter system. It's got to be. And that's the reason why I bought a D-series or a... Uh, um, a uh, race 3D. It's because I wanted to see what theirs was like. I've already messed with it, an Ultimaker. I just want to see how everybody solved their issues. That's why I had the Sigmas. I wanted yeah. to see how they solved their issues. Um, by adding more. By adding <laughs> adding more. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, so uh, that's why I bought those types of things because I wanted to see what they were doing. I said, oh, we have to do teeter totter. We have to do teeter totter. And he's like, no, I want to try this. And he had two statics. Um, easily adjustable statics. And it worked. But the reason why it worked was we solved bed tramming. Yeah. It's like the biggest issue yeah. with dragging your nozzle wasn't the fact that the nozzle was in the way. It was because your bed was garbage. <laughs> yep. <laughs> we solved bed tramming and that, that solved that issue. It's like, why are we why are we Going down this multi thousand, multi hundred thousand dollar solutions to solve something that we just hot glued together five years ago. Yep. Why are we doing that? Let's go back. Let's fix. Let's fix the the underlying issue and move forward because the amount of things that we could do once bed tramming is done and like all these small things are solved. No, like easy quick change nozzles without leaking and and heater cartridges that don't crush and the wires don't get ripped out of and all those these things, things. Are solved? No. Once we solve those. Uh and the crazy thing is it's like who's who's leading those charges? It's it's not the big companies. Like, not the big 3D printer companies. E3D are, is solving a lot of things. But when's the last time they sold a big box? Oh, they, they got, killed the big box. They got out of the game, but they're still the ones pushing forward. Yeah. How are they solving the issues of the 3D printers when they don't produce a 3D printer? Why are we le- why are we, Why are we throwing it at them? Shouldn't we be doing that? Instead of making the next thing that does the same thing the last thing did except for maybe it's bigger or slightly cheaper or or well no it's gonna be slightly cheaper to produce they ain't gonna drop that price or lighter <laughs> or 
Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I I agree with you. There's a uh, it's like let's fix let's fix day one issues rather than solve day one thousand issues by just hot gluing day one issues back together. Well, this is the same thing that I've been griping about forever. This is this is just a recap of like thirty six of our other episodes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what makes but, the rail core special? Uh bed tramming. True bed tramming. How do you uh, do it? The way we do it is magic. Uh so each the bed is driven by three lead screws. All That's step- weird. Yeah. All stepper motors, all three stepper motors are independently driven. Uh, which is why we require not only a duet Wi Fi or you can now choose Ethernet or uh, the duet Wi Fi with antenna. Um, but also, we also, also use a duet X5 and because we actually need three stepper drivers for the Z axis alone. Then you have your two for your X and Y and one for your, for your extruder. Um, but we have extras because tool changer is a thing and we want to implement it. Um, eventually. Eventually. Yeah. Um, but it also gives you the option to do like the dual, the dual Y carriage is actually available now through Mandela's store. Um, anyways, uh, so the way we do the, the true bed tramming is with each lead screw individually driven, we, we all, the system knows where each lead screw is and probes at each lead screw. And it's probing a bed that's a Mike 6 plate. It's the flattest plate we can get. Uh, yes, they're not the flattest of the flattest of flattest things, but you fl- find me a flatter piece of metal and I'll buy it. Uh, good luck. Um, but they're ground flat plates. So they're, I believe they're within like five thou. Um, so they're pretty flat. Anyways. They're cl- close enough to your plastic bobbles. Yes. So what we do is we probe at each lead screw and then the system will then move each lead screw independently to get the bed, tr- uh, level we like to do it three times before each print like before starting our first print and it normally gets the deviation i don't print unless the deviation is 0.003 millimeter or lower from edge to edge on the plate because why would you do anything less disgusting yeah (laughs) that's less than a hair that's a lot less than a hair a lot less than a hair so uh, because we know that's now flat, we can now, we now know as long as the orifice of your nozzle, the flat face right around the orifice, we, uh, as long as that's proper and you get like an E3D or a radium nozzle, we know those are good. You know, you're going to be, that's going to be parallel with the bed. So you're not going to get dragging unless you're over extruding. That's how we're able to do the dual. Um, and the biggest thing it's allowing us to do is you can do 0.01 millimeter layer heights from first layer up. You can, if you want to be dead before it's done, because you, it takes a <laughs> that's century. That's SLA and a half. layers, man. It's yeah. Well, I run my SLAs at zero five layers. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what we suggest is 0.02 at two, uh, 120 millimeters a second on a ZL. Um, you can get good results with that. That's screaming fast, too. And that's like injection molded looking products. If you look at the pictures posted, most of them are done at 120, 100 to 120 millimeters a second at 0.2, 0.02, sorry. Um, on the ZLT, I try to suggest, I tell people, I would stay below a hundred or below 120 and sit right at about a hundred, uh, at 0.02, just because you have such a tall printer and you will get some resonance just because of the size. Uh, but 120 is easy. We have a lot of people printing at 150 at like 0.3 millimeter layer heights because you can, and you're getting results that you're getting off of other printers at 60 millimeters a second. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like... That's what I your... normally run all my printers at, because it's Get a good sweet spot. <laughs> you need a real well, core, Joe. Well? <laughs> you need an IDEX real core, is all I'm saying. But, yes, we'll see. We need to continue that conversation. That conversation stalled, and we need to continue it. I, I have been going crazy. 
So. I, I went into my uh, post-con hibernation for a week. That's not true. I engineered the shit out of a rotary axis and then machined the shit out of a rotary axis for a week. Uh, yeah. <laughs> post Maker Fest. And I'm coming out of all of that now. And so we need to talk. We need to talk more. Yeah, we, we need yeah, to talk more. It wouldn't Factory be 42 thing. can help you. Who? We can, we can do good things. Yeah, we can do things. <laughs> I'm like, that's the cool thing about the project is it's like we the Railcore Labs team did a, like so much work to begin with. Um, we've just brought in our what we've been good at, and that's sourcing and getting prices down and stuff like that. But it's like there's been so many cool things that have been come that have come out of community members that are just amazing. And it's like, oh, we're 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 gonna try this. It's like, all right, and then they're, they're like, oh, guys, this is what this is what I made. It's awesome. You should make it too. And it's it's been amazing. Um, it's it's great. What's your favorite thing that you've seen made on a rail core? So, uh, mainly, uh, just because it stroked my ego a little bit. Uh, Austin, um, he, a guy named Austin bought, uh, built bought one of our first fully assembled printers, and he printed a mech with it, and. Like like a full size I can get inside it mech. No, no, no. Okay. A really cool, uh, a really cool mech. It was it was probably ten inches tall, um, but he did it like the first week he owned the Railcore. Nice. And um, I just remember that day because I got a message from Tony saying Steve wants to know what you did, and so do I. Because that's the best looking prints we've ever seen off of a rail core. We want to know what you did because it didn't take a bunch of tuning and stuff like that. It's like I just followed your documentation. That's all I did. <laughs> <laughs> I built it to your specs and like I turned the bolts with my hands. But the but the big <laughs> advantage was is I knew where to get the proper stuff. See, Tony and Steve have been building from what they could find on Amazon and Things they could find here and there and there and here. So they've been piecing their printer together. And it's like, oh, well, I have a good rail here and a rail from another company, but it was the only good one out of that batch. And the only good one out of that batch. And it's like, I was once I jumped in, I was like, oh, I know where to get this. And I know where to get that. And I know where to get this. And the biggest thing to get was linear rails. And we tried hard getting linear rails. And we did a lot of work on them. Um... The, our biggest problem was, I think we overwhelmed them. Uh, when, when we, in January, when I called Zeltec and I said I need this many rails, they said, "Yeah, that'll be June." <laughs> um, I was like, "No, no, no! I I need them tomorrow. Um, can we get them tomorrow?" <laughs> and so, like, they're DHLing rails from China. They're checking them, and then they're sending them to us, and we're checking them. And that really set our lead times back to start with. And then when I got contacted by Masumi, which we've been working with for a long time, they're like, see, you're using rails. We have these rails. Can we do something about it? And they were able to get me really good pricing on rails if I promised like $120,000 up front. <laughs> it's like, um, that's a binding contract, and I don't like being in debt. So, no. Can yeah. you do something? What's the best you could do? Because like, we reached out to the community and we said, hey guys, would you guys be happy if Masumi was standard, but the price is going to go up about $300. And we had so many people say yes, and then when it came time, nobody bought. Yeah. And then a couple people bought, but it wasn't enough. And then, so we're like, well, we can't do this big deal, so I can't get like Masumi's at like Really, really good prices, but I can get a good, decent price. Well, now the upgrade is like four hundred and fifty dollars rather than three hundred. And uh, but now it's like everybody's buying the Masumis. Well, the problem is, is if you go to a company like Masumi, you go, I need three hundred rails. They're like six to eight weeks. <laughs> it's like okay, but if you say I need forty rails this week, I need forty rails next week, and I need forty rails the next week. They'll say, okay, we can get them to you in eight days. Yeah. 
once you hit, you have to find the threshold. I, I play the game of Masumi. As long as you keep your order quantities under their thresholds, they keep you in everybody else's bulks and ship it out in like seven days. Oh, Once you okay. hit the threshold to become your own order, your one ultimate, your one bulk order from their factories, then you get held off for so many weeks. Huh. So that's interesting. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Um, so that's one of my tricks. <laughs> um, but uh, so like that's what that's another reason why our lead times had to stay stay the way they were is because I was I could only buy so much because I didn't sign a, a year contract for one hundred twenty thousand dollars. And yeah, probably it a good idea. It sucked. Oh, I would have hit it. I already hit it. Uh, what that threshold was, I didn't think I would, but I did. Uh. <laughs> Knowing <laughs> now. I would have, but it's like I would have tanked the company if something went wrong. Yeah. And it's like, I'm not going to do that. Um, and I've talked to so many people who have been parts of like failed 3D printer companies, and it's been because of deals like that. And all it takes is one thing to go wrong. And like, my company was started when everything was going wrong. Like, in my life, everything was falling apart. And I started a 3D printer company <laughs> because I needed something to do. Uh, I, underst- I understand that. Yeah, I, I started my company sitting next to my girlfriend in, di- in uh, chemo because she had just been diagnosed. Oh, God. Yeah. So I, I was sitting there that. designing printers kind there because I, I needed something to do. It's like bad things happen. I come from the medical industry. Everything bad happens when you think, oh, it's never going to happen. It's yeah. like, so we're, we're very cautious with how we do things. And we do everything lean. Because um, if you find a Railcore competitor, less than $5,000. I can't find one. No. And even though it's got a, a, a unsupported rail, I already gave the guys from Elite Machines <laughs> a hard time. I hate that. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it we're so t- much. We haven't had an issue. I, I still don't like it. Yeah, out of principle, but, you look at it and go, that shit's not going to work. But yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. But there's a lot of things in the real core I go, that ain't going to work, and it does. <laughs> yeah. So, Aaron, you, you have questions? You've been so quiet this episode. Well, I was waiting to ask the, uh, the bed tramming question, but then you asked it before me. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my... Gonna be my big question. <laughs> should you should you ask it now, and then we can add your voice clip in there <laughs> right before he says it? <laughs> uh, yeah, my, my I partially lost my voice this weekend, so that's not good. it's probably great that I'm not talking too much. Aaron had too much fun this weekend, apparently. That's exactly what happened. You should be ashamed of yourself. He had so much fun not returning any of my messages. Wow. Until two in the morning. Such a jerk. <sighs> <laughs> having a life outside the podcast. Well, it's been awesome having you on. We're well beyond the hour mark now. Do um, you have anything else you want to add? Say? Well, I mean, like, one of the biggest things about this big transition was everybody was upset. And the main, a couple people were upset. Two, two very vocal people were upset. <laughs> yes. Uh, is what it ended up being. And I understand that people were upset about the price difference, but people hated the fact that we were going to do a kit at $1,500 when we started. And then they realized, holy crap, it's worth it. And this is more than worth it now. Um, with the way it's set up, there's so many new things, so many awesome things. But the two people that were very upset, one of them was majorly against the fact that we chose Philistruder to go with. And the biggest thing with Philistruder was they were there in day one. Yeah. they, um, Tony and Steve have been helped out dramatically by Philistruder. There are other options, um, great options. Um, one person I want to want to work with in the future is Dave. Uh, yeah. Dave and I have talked about a lot of things. He has some awesome things in the work. Uh, 
there's I you know, like we've had people from other major resellers in the U.S. come up that just don't seem to fit the community. Um, they make you think they fit the community until they say things at Murph when they're drunk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, like you do, yeah. There's yeah, a couple, we say those things. There was a too. couple mistakes said out loud at Murph this year. <laughs> um, Over microphones. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, um, it's just the biggest thing was it was all done because they were part of the community day one, and well, I mean, I get it. Like, I remember the first time I put together a big kit of printers, and I didn't quite hit the minimums for bulk orders, and Tim was like, "Well." if you do this, we can hit the minimums. And so he, like he worked with me and we were like early on, you know, it, he was helping me do things that were awesome, like way back in the day. So Tim's a great dude. And I really like Phyllis Struger as a company. So, yeah. And like the cool thing is, is like, uh, there are, I see there's two major companies to go to these days. When you're a hobby th- in hobby 3D printing, that's Phil Struder and that's printed solid. Yep. And the cool thing is, is they do carry some different things. And normally, when one goes out of stock of something, or w- the cool thing is, is watching both sites when E3D announces something new, and seeing who's pl- who's uh, shipment lands first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and. So they're doing both doing awesome things. Dave just got a filament ex- uh, extrusion line. Yeah, because I'm so excited about that. Why not? Uh, yeah, we need more of those. Um, but I mean, like, and then Tim's got the at Phil Shooter's got the Phil Shooter itself, which is a fun tinkerer's thing. I tried to buy one, and he convinced me not to. Um, <laughs> only because the only reason why I he convinced me not to buy it was because I wanted to extrude HDPE. Oh God! What's wrong with you? <laughs> I I have I have fifty five gallon drums full of chips from the I side know. panels, and they're it's clean. Just recast them into panels, man. Well, I was like, someone has done it. I've seen it, and I was like, Tim, I want to buy one. And this is one reason why I love Tim because I'll be like, Hey, I want to buy this, and he goes, Why? I go, Because of this, and he goes, You're stupid. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much what he does because, like, he sent me that all he had to do was send me one message, and it's, it was a screenshot of a chat in his form that said, "Extruding HD or printing with HDPE is like banging your head against a concrete wall repeatedly and wondering why." <laughs> <laughs> because it will extrude out of a filler but it won't stick to anything. Like, yeah, not it's even lot, itself. <laughs> it's a lot like polypropylene. Yeah. Like, you ever except for print that it doesn't, crap? yeah. Except for it doesn't stick on masking tape, <laughs> which probably propylene will. <laughs> sort of. Yeah, I mean, like <sighs> there is a way, but HDPE is like, no, no, it just go away. It, it's like it makes sense because when you cut a bunch of it and then some of it gets on the floor in the shop on a concrete floor, you step on it, it's like ice. Yeah, just it chips. Is. It's ice, but it's the funnest like. If you want to get into machining, get HDPE. Yeah. It's so easy to cut, and it's a good beginner material. It's not easy to drill. If you're going to drill it, you got to drill slow and hit it hard. Hit it as uh, hard as you can. Why would you drill? What I, well, we just use a... We cheat. We end mill it and just tap it, and it's great. Yeah, but if you need to put an eighth-inch hole in something... And Should have pre that's your own fault. <laughs> yeah. I, I did figure out that if you need to drill an eighth inch with an eighth inch end mill, you do it at 10,000 RPMs and a hundred inch per minute plunge. Yeah. And yeah. that, that will send perfect corkscrew strings straight out and you do like 32nd inch pl- packs and that works real well. Yeah. It, it's a trick. It can be tricky sometimes, but it gets you to, it teaches you how to fine tune your depth of cut and your inches per minute and stuff like that. It, it's a good material. Um, it's hard to cut. I mean, like, don't ever buy a a plastic blade and cut it because 
we buy, you know, 25 sheets at a time and get them dropped. It's like, I used to cut one sheet at a time with a, with a circular saw. I was like, yeah. no, nah, this, this ain't happening. I do seven sheets at a time now. <laughs> and <laughs> I just use a standard, like, multi-purpose wood blade. Because I bought, I've spent probably $600 on these specialty plastic blades. Meant for HTPE. No, it's not. It's meant for, like, tubes where it has a, uh easy chip dispersal. Yeah. When you're doing sheets, it doesn't expect the, expect the chips to have to be lifted out. And those blades don't lift normally. They just yeah. throw. So it just packs it, and then it welds it back together. Yep. <laughs> it's like, congratulations, you cut your panel. Now she's no, got an didn't. ugly scar. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember hey, one thing that about HTP that's super fun is if you're doing it in a like a mill, um, and you have a long end mill, I was doing a three-inch deep depth of cut with a block side profiling. Yeah. Just at a hundred inches a minute, it just blasting through it and sending this huge rooster tail of chips across the room, and that's so fun. Yeah, it just makes it, you it, feel yeah. like a badass. Yeah, and you're, you're like, like, I'm machining wax, basically. So yeah, well, it's like, it's like, well, I'm milling. It's like I've always milled it like forty inches a minute and stuff like that on a CNC router, and then you're like, yeah. you put that down, you're like. Let's see what 150 inches of it. Like you slowly step up, and then you're like, "Yeah, I normally cut it at 150. Like, let's just uh, let's just keep going." <laughs> I've cut it at 400 inches a minute. Yeah. Well, we we actually we use five X carbs, so we can only push them so fast. Yeah, that was on an industrial machine, and yeah, a well, I mean, like, factor of 12. But I've it was got, fun to watch. I've got a 52 inch by 52 inch ball screw with uh, ATC. Um, like ready to go. It's just I got uh, X carves like for nothing, and yeah. they cut HDP perfectly. So I could buy five of those. I think I'm I'm total of like two grand into five X carves after just buying them off of people <laughs> that didn't know what they were wow. doing. And Man, that that ATC is gonna make you happy. Oh, it already has. Like just I just sit there and go and take the tool out. And stick it back in. It's just like, oh, <laughs> I don't have to. I don't have to wrench on these anymore. <laughs> I I don't. I, I miss my tool changer so much. That, anyway, that ATC cost more than all of the X cars combined. It was a three thousand like eight hundred dollar ATC by itself. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'll have one again. I'll sell okay. you one for three thousand nine hundred dollars. Will you take payments? <laughs> yeah, I need three thousand eight hundred dollars to rebuy mine up front. <laughs> the hundred dollars I'll take weekly, <laughs> twenty right, bucks good. weekly for four weeks. Good, five weeks. Sorry, <laughs> I'm mathing bad tonight. Well, that's what whiskey will do to you. And with that, keep making stuff, guys. This is the end of the podcast. Oop. Just stop in the recording. <laughs>